Wolfpack Football, A New Beginning, is brought to you by Washoe Medical Center, leading in healing. By Reno Jeep Eagle, you'll save more on mill. And by the El Dorado Hotel and Casino, live the excitement. It truly is a new beginning for the Wolfpack. A new season, a brand new team, new hopes for another Big West Conference championship. But the biggest change is right at the top with a brand new head coach. Coming back. After 17 years as Wolfpack head coach, Chris Alt stepped aside this summer. How much better can it get for you? <clears throat> you're at the top. Your players, your coaches took you there. You've got a community that backs the program 100%. Where do you go from there? Alt will concentrate on his duties as athletic director. And the man Alt handpicked as his successor was Jeff Horton. What a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to get the head coaching job at a, a great university like this, my alma mater, where I graduated from. I, I, it's, it's just a dream come true. Horton was an assistant coach for the Wolfpack for six years. There was one break during that tenure when he went to UNLV for one season as assistant head coach, but he returned to Reno. Horton is a much different person than Chris Alt. Alt is your classic type A personality. Horton seems much more laid back, even self-effacing. When we talked to him at the Big West Conference football meetings last month, you get the impression that the promotion still hasn't quite sunk in yet. When I checked in today, or yesterday, nobody knew who I was, didn't have my reservation or nothing else, so you know, hopefully after another year they'll know who I am. The coaching staff at the University of Nevada is very close-knit, and Horton was among them since he was an assistant coach for so long. These guys hang out together, they play golf together, but Horton says he'll definitely let everyone know who's the boss. Yeah, nobody comes around anymore. I can't, I can't get anybody to play golf with me, can't get anybody to do anything. You know, the players don't even come around. No, it's, uh, you know, those guys know me. They know I expect them just to do their job, much like Chris did all of us, and, uh, you know, they all have delineations that I give them, and, you know, we have a good staff, and the best thing about coach hiring from within said a lot, Number one, about him as a person, because in our profession, usually it doesn't happen that way. And number two, we've got to keep our staff intact, and we've got to hire a couple other guys. But I feel we have a, a quality staff that has worked well together in the past and is going to continue to do that. And the early reviews are good. I think he's going to um, bring some more enthusiasm, spirit to the team. Uh, it, it's just new blood. It, he talks to you just like you're a person, you know, not like you're a piece of meat or a robot. And I think that's what everybody looks for. I think. That reason right there is going to make even our players work harder and be more of a better team in the coming years because of him. I think I'm different than Chris. You know, Chris is, uh, you know, stern, boom, 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 one way to do it. And, and not that I'm not stern. You know, I think my kids know where I draw the line, but you got to be your own person and, and put your personality in the team. And I, I think when you do that, when you try to be yourself, you'll be more successful. Horton says don't expect any radical change in the offense or in the defense. And he does acknowledge that anything short of going to the Las Vegas Bowl will be a disappointment. I think the people in Reno expect that. You know, we, uh, we made the mistake last year of winning the championship in the first year. You know, if, if we hadn't won it, you know, people say, ah, it's okay, they're growing. But, but now winning it, you know, that makes a difference. And, uh, but that's good. You know, that means your program's arrived and, and we want to stay on top. And we know everybody, we snuck up on them last year and they'll be gunning for us this year. So we'll have to be ready. One other note about Jeff Horton. The last time he was a head football coach, 1983, when he was at Bishop Minogue, right over the hill. In fact, during his home games, he could hear cheering from Mackey Stadium. Coming up next, we'll take a look at the Wolfpack defense. There are some big holes to fill. Stay with us. Wolf defense, that will get them there. The biggest concern is the defensive secondary. All four starters from last year's team have waved bye-bye. The schedule helps us a little bit that way because we don't face a great passing teams early. So we got a chance to get our four DB guys squared away a little bit. It's going to be exciting. I tell you, we're as athletic and fast as we've ever been on defense. Now we have zero game experience, and so we're going to have to make up with this with some effort and enthusiasm and get after guys. There's also a big hole in the linebacking core. Last year's leading tackler, Lamont Porter, didn't make grades. He's not on the team this year. That means guys like Steve Bryant of Reed High School are going to have to pick up the slack. I just go out there and play football. If, uh, if I have to make 20, 30 tackles a game, I'll do that. But if, you know, our defense is all schemed out to every player's got a job, and as long as every player does it, we should have no problems. 
But just because there are some question marks doesn't mean the pack defense will tiptoe through the schedule. As strange as it sounds, this is an offensive defense. The philosophy here is make something happen. We're not going to sit back and wait. I mean, we learned that style from Coach Alt. I mean, we can't be passive and sit back and that old bend but don't break there. We don't believe in that. We want to force the issue. Most of the times you got to read your keys and do all that stuff, but once you really get out there, it's seek and destroy. The good news, despite the losses, the pack has eight players who either started or saw significant playing time defensively last year. I think it's just a matter of... Uh, the young kids going through camp and learning their position and just coming together as a whole defense instead of, you know, each position has to do their own thing. But by, by Wisconsin, I think our whole defense would be one. I mean, we expect and demand great things just like we do for the whole program. We expect to win and we expect to be conference champions. So if that's on the spot, well, yeah, we're on the spot. But it's that way every year. Well, I remember four years ago when Brock was here and Forey and those guys, uh, they were all started off pretty much as freshmen. Sure. Everyone got gray hairs. You don't have any gray hairs to lose. No, none at all. And not worried about that now. <laughs> It'd take us nine years for me to grow it back. Speaking of giving coaches gray hairs, there's still a big question mark about the place kicking job. Philip Stamper and Jamie Beebe are fighting for the number one position. And when you consider that out of the 12 games the pack played last year, five of them were determined by four points or less, well, you realize just how important the kicking game is. At this point, Stamper and BB are still fighting it out. There's no clear-cut winner. And now, as the season's about to start, the Wolfpack plays the University of Wisconsin in its very first game, and Wisconsin is picked fourth in the Big Ten this year. There's talk about them even being a contender for the Rose Bowl. And the questions about the defense and the place kicking are still up in the air. Back on Wednesday, the Pack had one of its final scrimmages of the preseason. We have a lot of work to do uh, offensively. We have to eliminate turnovers. We had a fumble today, uh, some missed assignments. Defensively, we have to cause the turnovers. Uh, dropped a couple interceptions today and, and kicking game. Today went backwards. Our field goal kickers have been kicking pretty good, but today I think we made two out of ten. Without that, you know, we're going to be in a lot of trouble in Wisconsin. Offensively, the Wolfpack's going to go with a one-back set this year. That means one running back to handle the ball. And up next, Dana Wagner takes a look at the dogfight for that one starting job. Wolfpack Football, a new beginning, is brought to you by the... So you figure there'd be plenty of room in Mackey Stadium, right? Well, that may be true here in the stands, but not on a football field. The offensive backfield is getting quite crowded. They have an abundance of talent fighting for just one position. The running back log jam begins with junior Diedrich Holmes. Then there's senior Zeke Moore. Don't forget about Rashawn Miller. And the newcomer is Marcellus Krishan. Only one of them can start, and no one knows who will emerge from preseason as the number one guy. Oh, they all can play, and it's a good thing because it makes, challenge, it makes practice a big challenge. So every time we come out in the field, you got to lock it up and get ready to go. So it's going to be a good fight. Head coach Jeff Horton says this is the kind of problem coaches love to have. He says four talented guys competing for one spot is good for the team. Makes us better, makes us better, you know, and even when we compete, like we talked about yesterday in the team meeting, the offense against the defense now, we want to treat it like a game because competition makes us better. We want a guy to want to be a winner, another one to be the loser. Coming into fall practice, junior Diedrich Holmes was the number one guy. He's led the team in rushing the past two seasons. He started seven games last year, rushing for 521 yards and four touchdowns. He added another in the Las Vegas Bowl against Bowling Green. While Holmes wants to be number one, he's willing to compete with the other three for the spot. Makes me better and makes the team better. It's the last hurrah for senior Zeke Moore. He started 12 games in the last three seasons, including four last year. But he lost his starting job to Holmes, and now he wants it back. I think about it a lot. I mean, I feel like I'm a starting player, type player that I like to be. I like to be a starter, you know. I like to contribute as much as possible. So I think about it quite a lot, and that's like my only goal, you know, is to start. You know? Some say the running back to watch is the new kid on the block. Number 22, Marcellus Krishan, impressed the coaches at last Saturday's scrimmage. The junior college All-American rushed for 109 yards on 15 carries, despite being only 165 pounds. Yes, you, you got to understand, there was David and there was Goliath, you know, and I'm, I'm that David factor right now. Rashad has impressive credentials. He led the nation's junior college running backs with 1,800 yards last year. He scored 24 touchdowns. He's one of the pack's most coveted recruits, a running back who's very quick. 
the guy who wants to take the number one job away from Holmes or Moore. We're, we're friends, you know, uh, we're teammates. I, I understand those guys' positions, but they also understand my position. I'm a junior college transfer, and I'm not coming here to uh, sit on the bench. And if I, if I do, then it's my fault I do. No one wants to sit the bench, but only one guy can start. It seems like an impossible equation for Coach Horton to keep everyone happy. You can't really do it because everybody's going to want to play a lot of downs, so somebody's going to be upset. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. Wolfpack fans hope the only one that will be upset will be the opposing team as Wolfpack runners find the end zone. Dana Wagner, News Channel 8. Well, whatever the running back situation, we do know two things definitely about the Wolfpack offense this year. First, Chris Vargas will be the starting quarterback. No debate this time. And second, his favorite target will be Brian Reeves. We'll take a look at those two guys right after this. Strike a pose. Wolfpack Football, A New Beginning, is brought to you by John Esquaga's Nugget. You could argue quite convincingly that the Wolfpack has the best quarterback and the best wide receiver in the Big West Conference. Here's a look at Chris Vargas and Brian Reeves. There are probably no two more dissimilar people than Chris Vargas and Brian Reeves. Vargas is laid back. Reeves is out of control. Vargas's idea of having fun is 18 holes of golf. Reeves loves to dance, and it doesn't take much prodding to get him to strike a Heisman Trophy pose. But there are some similarities. Both guys are not heavily recruited out of high school, but both have proved their critics wrong. I mean, I took some trips somewhere, and they just kind of looked at me and just kind of looked up and down and said, ah, oh, you know, it's nice having you here. See you later. And, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you're too small, you're, you're, you're too slow, and what have you. And, you know, it's just nice to go out there. And, I mean, it's nice satisfaction for me because I knew I could do it. If you're a receiver, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to catch passes. So if they're throwing the ball, I mean, you're supposed to do everything in your power to catch the ball. And I figure if he's throwing it to me, you know, I'm going to catch it. I'm not going to let nobody else catch it. And both guys have become stars at Nevada. Vargas for his remarkable string of come-from-behind victories. And Reeves for his ability to make the catch and make the big play. A perfect example, last year's comeback win over Utah State. Vargas did the passing, and Reeves did the catching, including the game winner with 1.12 left on the clock. A lot of people talk about, oh, Chris brought him back again and everything, but I, I mean, I threw in the double coverage. It should have been picked off, and it should, he just ripped it out of his hands. It was, that was his game, you know. He made the play at the right time, and it was, it was his magic, basically. I didn't even see the other guy behind me. I only saw the one in front of me, and I just, I don't know, I still can't explain that catch, and I'm not going to even try. Reeves loves the attention, and maybe that's what motivates him. Score a touchdown, you get noticed. Yeah, I guess you could say that. No, I just, it's just me. I just do, you know, I can't score a touchdown and just jog off the field. I have to, I don't know, I just have to entertain somebody, I guess. That's what you call it. So every time I catch a touchdown, I just try to, you know, do something to make the fans laugh or, you know, make them cheer. Hey, I like our kids to be selfish. You know, you don't want a guy out there on third and eight not wanting the ball, and he says, hey, just call my number. I'll find a way to get open, and that's, you know, half the battle. I watch all my dances from last year every day. I watch the tape, at least one tape every day of one dance. I got to see it, you know. <laughs> just so you can improve yeah, on it. You're exactly. a perfectionist in uh -huh. that regard. Yep, I got to right. perfect my dances. And while Vargas may not get down and get funky, don't underestimate his desire. When it gets to become a game, you know, it's, it's, it's down and dirty. You know, I don't do anything to, to win, and, and I think uh, a lot of guys want that in a team player. Look at Chris, you know, he's not, I don't want to say real impressive just because he's not a big guy, but he, you know, he looks like a, a pro golfer or something. But as you get to know Chris, and I've golfed with him several times, it's funny, but he's a competitive, competitive person loves challenges, never feels a pressure, loves a pressure situation. And, you know, I think this year with him knowing that he's the guy, it's his team, he's got to be the leader, that he'll be that much better. He won't have to look over his shoulder because he knows that he's going to have to lead us to the championship. And, and I told Varg, hey, my first year of coaching, I don't know how to coach from 25 points behind, so hopefully he'll put his 25 points ahead. It, it's funny because uh, as I was driving over here, I was thinking, man, this is probably going to be my last year of football. You know, I was out there watching... Um, uh, the freshman and JC guys practice. I was like, man, I might be out here next year and I'm not going to be playing, you know. It's, it's just a different feeling. I'm just going to go out and try to enjoy this year and uh, make a lot of memories. But Reeves has plans on playing after his senior season. He has his heart set 
on the NFL. Oh, yeah, that's been my uh, dream all my life. And, you know, I'm not going to stop now. This is my last year here, so I want to go out with a bang and just try to do everything I can to help me get to the next level. As for Vargas, long after the cheering stops, he'll be perfectly happy with a degree in accounting and frequent trips to the golf course. In fact, Chris has a plan. My goal is to retire when I'm 49 and go on the senior PGA when I'm 50. So I got, I got about 28 years in practice, so <laughs> hopefully I'll get there. By the way, Reeves only needs to catch 33 more passes to set the school record for the most receptions in a career. Up next, we'll take a look at the Wolfpack's opposition as our Wolfpack preview continues. Wolfpack, but what about the other team from the Big West Conference? Let's separate the contenders from the pretenders. This season, the Big West Conference has adopted a consortium format for football only and has added four new schools, Arkansas State, Louisiana Tech, Northern Illinois, and Southwest Louisiana. The four additions mean that 10 teams will be competing for the conference championship and the right to play in the Las Vegas Bowl. Well, I think it's uh, uh, truly the best thing that the conference could do. Uh, I think it's uh, also a situation where some more expansion in the eastern part would be of benefit. For instance, we're getting coverage in Dallas newspapers, we're getting coverage in Chicago newspapers, things that we would have not gotten. I think it gives us an opportunity to be proactive and not sit around waiting to see what other teams in the country do. I think uh, Independence Bowl is here today as a result of, of expanding interest as far as the bowl teams are concerned because we're including more teams and I, I think it'll get bigger and I think it'll be two divisions one of these days Then I think there'll be a playoff for the championship to go to the bowl game and I think that's going in the right direction in college football for us. Well, here are the preseason predictions for 1993 from the Big West coaches. As you can see, a couple of the new teams, Louisiana Tech and Northern Illinois, are expected to contend for the title. But the preseason number one pick is Utah State. If the Aggies had hung on and beaten the Wolfpack in that remarkable come-from-behind victory back in November, it would have been Utah State going to the Las Vegas Bowl last year. And with eight returning starters on offense and seven on defense, the Aggies are looking to get some revenge this year. Our young men, uh, were, they were very upset about that game, of course. Uh, it, of course, it meant the conference championship, uh, no ring, no bowl, uh, no recognition. And, of course, that's what they're playing for is an opportunity to win the conference and go to the Las Vegas Bowl. So, yeah, there's, there's an intense rivalry there already. And every year, San Jose State figures to be in the conference title picture. This year, the Spartans have won the best running backs in the conference, Nathan Dupree, formerly of Wooster High School. And the Spartans also have a new coach, former Stanford and Denver Broncos coach John Ralston, who's back in the coaching saddle at age 66. I'm going to learn every single day I'm on the job, but no one will be trying to learn quicker, faster than John Ralston. As for the rest of the teams, well, you got to hand it to these guys. The Big West may have the most honest coaches around. Ask them a direct question, you get a direct answer think that you might be able to sneak into contention? No. All indications are we're ranked at the very bottom of the conference in preseason projections and you know there's not there's not we have done nothing to uh, change that. We'll win somewhere between three and six games. If we win six I'll I'll be a hero and get a new contract. If we win three I'm going to really look at 1994. So the Wolfpack opens up its season next Saturday. The Pack plays its very first game on the road against the University of Wisconsin Badgers from Madison, Wisconsin. It marks the very first time the University of Nevada has ever played a Big Ten football team. You can watch that game in every Wolfpack road game right here on News Channel 8. September 4th against the University of Wisconsin from Madison, Wisconsin. Then October 16th against Utah State. October 30th at Pacific. November 13th at New Mexico State. And we wind up the regular season on the road November 20th against Arkansas State. So join Dan Gustin and me with all the action starting September 4th. And we'll see you next Saturday from Madison, Wisconsin. Wolfpack Football, a new beginning, has been brought to you by John Esquaga's Nugget, home of the Labor Day Rib Cook-Off. By Jones West Ford, where you'll find bigger selection and lower prices on new and used cars and trucks. And by Washoe Medical Center, leading in healing.
Pack attack 93 going prime time. Next. The best thing since mom's apple pie. Coming up next. Pack attack 93. A preseason look, if you will. Ah, the sports of gentlemen. <laughs> we'll explore the defense. The offense. <laughs> the new coach. <laughs> Biscuit? <laughs> the season schedule will revisit our most delightful 92 season. You'll have to lock it in. So stay with us for Pack Attack 93, the preseason special. In the next hour, we're going to take a look at the defending Big West Conference champs, the Pack. Can they four-peat? Joining me now, Rick Renner. And Rick, around here, it's been win, win, win. No question about it. You're talking two Big Sky championships, then a Big West championship under Coach Chris Alt, but he turns in his whistle for the front office. We got a new guy heading the signals, Jeff Horton. And with all the graduation on defense, we're talking about an all-together new team. Ah, but one thing that'll be the same more, that Vargas to Reeves Mackie Magic. We'll take a look at that and a whole lot more as we dissect the pack. Pack Attack 93. Stay with us. Log it in. Ticket, ticket, two for the 50 yeah, the pack will be a hot ticket in 93. What a 92 season. Another win over Las Vegas. They're the only team to jump divisions go into Division One, and they win the title. Let's take a look back at that glorious 92 season. After an opening season loss to Wyoming, the pack came out howling as they made their Big West Conference debut. Before 24,111, Nevada took care of Pacific 20 to 14. Chris Vargas to Brian Reeves, a portent of things to come. Game six, the rivalry renewed. The pack in Las Vegas taking on UNLV. We pick it up tied at seven in the third. Brock Marion strips Shannon McLean. Will Lackey scoops it up and scores. The patched up 14 7. Late in the game, it's the defense and Brock Marion doing it again. Brock, the game-saving interception. He's the game's MVP. The Pack beats the Rebels 14 to 10. The Fremont Cannon remains in Reno for the fourth straight year. Game seven, homecoming. Patty Sheehan among the inductees into the Nevada Hall of Fame and a couple of guys that may get there someday. Fred Gatlin going to Brian Reeves. A 57-yard touchdown. The Pack knocks off New Mexico State 35 to 21. But the following week at home, the Pack's 21-game regular season win streak was snapped by Weber State. Maybe they were looking ahead to week nine. Big fun in San Jose with an inside track to the conference title on the line. And San Jose State builds a 36 to 14 lead. Former Wooster star Nathan Dupree rushes for 160 yards. But the Pack would rally. They score 28 second half points. Brian Reeves, 15 catches for 161 yards. Chris Vargas comes in for Fred Gatlin in the second half and throws for 333, but the rally falls short. San Jose State hangs on 39-35. Game 10 on the stage was set for another Mackey miracle. With over 11 minutes to go, Utah State led Nevada 40-21, and some didn't have faith. Abracadabra, it's Vargas time. First, he hits Michael Stevens on a beautiful 15-yard touchdown. Utah State scores to go up by 19, but the pack would answer. Brian Reeves gets in the end zone, and it's 47-35. Now, with just over two minutes to go, it's Vargas to Reeves again. Vargas, five TDs for the game at 388 yards. The pack's down five. It's onside kick time, and just like the year before against Weber State, the ball bounces Nevada's way. Steve Lester, the kick. Keith Eaton, the recovery. Now, two minutes to win it. You're now watching what could be the biggest play in Nevada football history. Chris Vargas to Brian Reeves. What a catch. They do it. They pull off another Mackey miracle. A 28-yard touchdown. They came all the way back to defeat Utah State 48-47. I've been through so much at this university that I thought nothing would amaze me, but man, oh, man, never count us out, huh? Vargas had his average comeback day. <laughs> and I don't know how to explain it. God's blessed our team. He's blessed me. Um, it's been great. God bless you, Vargas. Yes. <laughs>
Dame 11 and the Pac Seniors bid farewell to Mackey Stadium. It's an easy finale against Texas Southern, and quarterback Fred Gatlin goes out in style. He throws three touchdowns and runs for one. The Pack wins easily 38-14, to and on this same day, San Jose State loses. So the Pack outright Big West champs. Hello, Las Vegas Bowl. The flying Elvi would have nothing compared to the show that the Wolf Pack would put on in the first ever Las Vegas Bowl. Oh, a frigid cold night in a silver bowl. Nevada taking on Bowling Green. And the Falcons would make it look easy early, muscling up on the ground, and then some brains to go with that brawn. The flea flicker to the quarterback, Eric White. Bowling Green's up 28-3 to at halftime. Chris Vargas replaces Fred Gatlin, and the magic act begins. First, the touchdown pass to Mike Sr. Then, behind a wall of blockers, Diedrich Holmes plows into the end zone. Make it 28-17, keep on swinging, and Chris Vargas does. To his tight end, Tom Matter, and after three quarters, it's 28-24. And in the fourth, the pack doesn't skip a beat. Brian Reeves slithers his way into the end zone, and the comeback's complete. Down 28-3 at one point, Nevada now takes a 31-28 lead, and that comeback magic on display for the entire nation. But did it happen too soon? With 1.45 to go, Steve Lester drops the snap, and Bowling Green set up at the 15. The Pack D forces a fourth and goal with under 30 seconds to go, but Eric White hits David Hankins, and it's over. The Pack comeback is spoiled. Bowling Green wins 35-34. We keep our heads up because we kept that Wolfpack tradition going that don't quit. And we just didn't quit. We just kept going. We are now on the map. Um, there's no one to take, take that from us. We are the only team in the history of the United States to go from any division to Division One and win a championship the first year. With that 92 season, Chris All thought he had brought Nevada football to the pinnacle, to the Las Vegas Bowl. In fact, that was when he realized he didn't want to coach anymore. But it's just going to be weird. It's going to seem like the sidelines are empty without Coach Ed. That, uh... That Bowling Green game? <clears throat> That Bowling Green game was was the greatest thrill of a lifetime. And I'm telling you, you saw kids, <clears throat> coaches, emulate what Wolfpack football is about. And it was after that game that I began to think, how much better can it get for you? <clears throat> As I got into that thing, and boy, I mean, things start flashing back, and you see your old players there and the coaches. It, the you could not you know your mind cannot control your emotions and I, I really thought I've got it made but I think back at it Rick you know it, I think it's a historic moment in my life emotions of seeing the Joe Caspers at six foot seven 285 pounds standing in front of the team and, and, and crying like a baby and how much he he loved the team and the camaraderie and Shariar Podonish grabbing him and Chris Vargas who was MVP grabbing the other players I mean it was such an emotional uh, experience that I had that it's something it, it's a treasure that you never want to lose you know and and uh, walking out of that locker room I didn't realize that I'd be getting out of coaching that time but I know there was a there was a real fulfillment of satisfaction you know of man we've made it we've come I mean being 18 point underdogs and, and should have won the game uh, it was a thrill and it just showed me that we're where we belong and we're going to get bigger and better you know after he resigned i gave him 48 hours to get out of his office and everything and last time people saw he's walking across the parking lot dropping pictures and stuff but he's been very good to me and the staff you know he helped recruit all these players here and you know i'm just excited about the opportunity to to follow him he's a great legacy that i got to follow but i'd rather do it that way than take over one on the bottom the pressure's more getting on top right from the start but that's why i coach for him yeah, I miss him. I miss his mot his talks, his motivational talks, his comments out on the field. You know, the way he coaches. I mean, he jumps everybody's butt, you know, but it's for a reason, you know. It's just to make you better. He, he can really pump you up, but uh, I think Coach Ford has got that same quality. Motivates you. It doesn't matter what you do out there, you're going to find a way to win. And, uh, and he's instilled that into our kids, and he's instilled that into Jeff. That's why Jeff got that job, because he's carrying on that tradition of Nevada football. All indications are that... One of the reasons why Alt 
resigned and, and stepped up in that athletic director position. He he wanted that cannon. He's got a tr case up there that he's built. He put that thing out in his yard. Did he really do that? Is there any validity or truth to that? <laughs> Rick, there will be opportunities next year. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of a couple of them at this particular time. Uh, and, you know, to, to be very honest with you, uh, I didn't get out of coaching to get back into it. What's the first thing that comes to, to your mind when you hear these names, okay? Brian Reeves. Doofus. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Brian sees that. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Brian Reeves has the most potential of any player I've ever coached. Jeff Ward. Good person. Uh, Chris Hall. Oh, and well, that, you know, there's a lot of thoughts on that one. You know? <laughs> I don't know if they're all good, though. Coming up on Pack Attack 93, we'll take a closer look at Chris Alt's replacement, Jeff Horton, and we'll go up close with Brian Reeves. Pack Attack 93 goes prime time. Stay with us. Welcome back to Pack Attack 93, our preseason look. And shocking news during the offseason. Chris Alt steps aside after 17 years, and now there's a new man running things from the top. Not me. Coach Hort, Jeff Horton, who took over the reins that infamous spring day. Chris started against uh, Cal State Hayward. They don't even play football anymore, and I have Wisconsin, so something's wrong there. But it was your fault. You're the guy that That's made right. The I'm the guy that scheduled. I was doing it for the extra money that they were giving, thinking that maybe Coach would give us a race. I told our kids, the only people that believe we can win this game is the coaching staff and our players, and we're planning to shock the nation on September 4th. Uh, when we do that, our program is known on the West Coast. This game means instant credibility around the nation. Uh, our goal is the top 30 program. That'll be our first step in doing so. He's one of the nicest persons you'll ever meet. If Ward gave blood, you'd probably discover liquid pig skin. Jeff started football in elementary school deep in the heart of Texas, where football is religion. Lettered at Arkansas, won an Orange Bowl, head coach to Bishop Minogue, and learned from two masters of the game as an assistant, both Lou Holtz and Coach A. Lou Holtz, the thing I learned from him is, number one, organization, two, motivation. He's a, he's a master motivator and a great organizer and, and a leader of people. And, I've tried to take things from him and then spending eight years with Chris Alt, you know, just his discipline and style and his work ethic and the way he drives the players to be the best they can be. I really felt that I learned from two great coaches there. With Alt's move to the front office solely, Hort gets the luxury of an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator. And the move to head coach from assistant has brought on a whole different atmosphere at Cashel Fieldhouse. They don't come around as much. Even the assistant coaches don't. You know, we used to always hang out together. Now I'll see them go out. You know, nobody ever invites me anymore, so I just kind of go home and sit around by myself with my wife or whatever. So I think the, the biggest difference has been in practice. You know, sometimes I really actually get bored because I was always used to coaching the receivers and working with them and looking at them. And, and now I kind of just walk around, and it's been fun to see all the different drills and different coaches coaching, but there's always a point in time where I'd like to have my own guys. So I'll go coach five minutes with the running backs, maybe five minutes with the line, and kind of jump in there. I think they like it when the head coach comes around. Our society and world is so messed up these days. You know, you got so many problems out there. People have no respect for other people's lives, for property or anything. And but yet in football, we can kind of still get kids to believe in what you want to believe in you can drive them you can push them and, and they respond to that you know kids nowadays still want discipline and they may not like it all the time but in the long run they'll appreciate it and i guess the greatest thing is after they leave and two or three or four years down the road and they come back and say thanks and you, you see that they're successful in business they graduated from college you know that makes it all all worthwhile and, and still to this day when i run on the stadium on game day as assistant or whatever i still get the goosebumps when the crowd roars the fan plays the cannon goes off and i i think the day that those goosebumps go away is the day i get out of coaching but right now i still get that just that eerie feeling when you take the field Horton's ticket back to the las vegas bowl comes through prime time his old receiver brian reeves and here's the g-man with his story there he is, prime time. Brian Reeves, the fan-pleasing, record-breaking, touchdown-making wide receiver. He set school records last year for catches in a season with 81 and yards in a season with 1,114. He also punched up 10 touchdowns. And in his senior season, all he needs are 33 catches to break the school's all-time pass-catching record. And if those numbers don't tell you the story, Brian will fill in the blanks. Oh, how you doing? Yeah. Big West player of the year. That's me, baby. Heisman Trophy candidate. That's me. 
if it was left up to me, we would never run, and we would only have one receiver, and that would be me, and we'd throw it to me every time. But, you, you know, that you got to have a receiver has to have that mentality. He can't settle for, you know, being average or being, you know, with the rest. He, he, he needs to settle for being number one, being the top. And that's my mentality. I mean, I want the ball all the time. The DBs, they, they, can't, they can't stop me. They can't shut me up no matter what. If they do make one good play, they still won't shut me up because I'll get mad and I'll tell them something else and make them mad, and then once they get mad, it's over. <laughs> because I can do basically what I want to do with him when I make a man. That's his game. I mean, he talks. I mean, but he always backs up what he says. Brian can't, can't be quiet. He can't shut up. Brian always has to always talk. <laughs> but he gets it done. Yeah. He's a go-to guy in clutch situations. He wants the ball. He wants you to call his number. And there's not a lot of players like that out there. And he's adds that little spunk to the game. You know, he, he gets everybody pumped up. He's the, he's the juice out there. And uh, he's going to make the big plays. And... Yeah, big plays like that game winner against Utah State. I look at that play every day. I mean, and I... I wonder how I just went for the ball and, you know, unfortunately I came up with it and I thank God, you know, for giving me the strength and the power to make that catch. And uh, now I try to set my jaw to make catches like that all the time, you know. What inspires Brian to make some of these history-making plays? The Mackey faithful, of course. Fans are great, you know, they come out to every game and I feel that I have to put on a show for them, so that's what I try to do. And I love kids. I like any time I can do something for some kids, you know, speak to them. Uh, read to him, sign autographs for him, you know, go around, hang out with him, take care of him, I I'll do it. One of the reasons Brian has such a rapport with children is because of the great relationship he had with his mother. He thinks about her every day. She passed away a couple years ago. I wish she could have been here, you know, to see it, you know, see my last year, see me, if I do go to go, and uh, that, that pulls me up. Maybe up to the NFL. Right now, Brian is projected to be a second through fourth round pick in next year's draft. But while he's still here, he's got another individual goal to take care of. Okay. I got to tell Vargas, see my quarterback and everything, I love you. But uh, if we go back to the bowl game, I got to try to take that MVP trophy this year because you got it last year. <laughs> Next up on Pack Attack 93, we'll take a look at Reeves' receiver mate, the entire offense, including that great competition at running back. Stay with Pack Attack 93. Sure, there's always a lot of excitement with the Wolfpack passing game, Airwolf, but this year, some stars at running back. That's right, the return of Zeke Moore, Deidre Combs, but the guy everybody's looking at, the speedster, the junior college rusher of the year, Marcellus Grishon. Get him now! I feel like we're all men in the men's sports, so uh, let's get it on. There's nobody out there should put a fear in anybody on the football field. You know, everybody's a little crazy in their own way. Fearless Marcellus has brought a reckless style of running with him from Saddleback, where he was the nation's best J.C. runner. What a blast to watch him play. Jeez. Doo -doo -doo. He's like a ricochet rabbit. Marcellus competing to be number one. All those other guys know, heck, my job might be on the line if this guy performs well. Yeah, great competition in running back. Can the bruising veteran Zeke Moore outduel the speedster Marcellus? I would love to be the go-to guy. Um, fighting the best I can, doing the best I can. I know I have a lot of competition, but I just want to just keep doing the things I'm doing, do the best I can, and hopefully I will be in that number one spot. If not, I'm going to work until I get there. Another muscle back with a shot at the starting spot is Diedrich Holmes, the senior led Nevada in rushing last year with 557 yards. It's probably been Division One. We're getting better athletes now, so it's a lot of competition. As opposed to the last few years I was here, it's just like two guys are going to play, and that's the end of it. But now we're deep at every position. And the other guy that could get the start is Rashawn Miller. The sophomore rounds out the big four that will be fighting it out for most of the playing time. A couple of other names to keep an eye on. The sophomore from Reno, Steve Mayville. And a late arrival to camp, Damon Lynch. He rushed for over 100 yards in the Pac's final regular season game against Texas Southern. But all the talk seems to center around Marcellus. He is quick. He's, uh, he's one of the few guys that can play tennis by himself. You know, he's that quick. And uh, we haven't seen any speed like that here in Nevada since I've been here. And I know Frank Hawkins and those guys, they weren't fat. They were just big old plow horses. Chavez Foger thinks he was that fast. He's not even in this guy's class. But... Let's bounce it over to Rick Renner now. We'll look at the wide receivers. Gone. Chris Singleton to professional baseball. But oh, what a talented, infected group of receivers the pack have. Looking to take the freeway to success. 
I just feel that, you know, uh, I got to get to the end zone. got to get the extra yard, first down, first and 10, first and goal, touchdown, you know. I just want to get the ball. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> not bringing me down, you know. I got to run hard, run forward, not backwards. Positive yards, no negatives. What he does after he catches the ball is he, he knows there's a goal line at the other end of the field, and he's going to find a way to get there. Uh, he's not the fastest guy in the world, but he's relentless, and he's physical. And what I have to do, and that's my job as a coach, is to develop the talent, and that'll be done. You'll see enough receivers out there catching footballs, and we'll be exciting, and we'll be fun to watch, and we're going to go out there and win that championship. Air Wolf doesn't land there. Junior Mike Sr. beat up last year, but still managed to make the big play when he came in with those stick em like hands. Oh, I love it. You know, you got to love when you can throw the ball 50 times a game, offset with the run 35. We have some good receivers, some great quarterbacks, and so hopefully Air Wolf will be in full effect this year. <laughs> At tight end, it's a battle between Freddie Downtown Williams and Tom Matter. Right now, Matter Matter. But at the end of the year, it could be at all different matter. We're going to run, you know, two sets a lot, and it's him first, and anything happens, you know, but we're going back and forth, and so it's a battle. So it's going to go on for last game. You go into sports to have pressure. You know, you want the pressure on your shoulders. You want to go out and compete. You know, I look at it. In high school, we never won. A, I mean, we were nothing. We were always a 500 team. I've been here the three years I've played. We've got three championships. I'm looking for a fourth. I want four rings. So. Enough of these fancy running backs and wide receivers. Let's get to the blue-collar guys, the O-line. You know, not an oversized low, but I tell you one thing, these guys can play. Yeah, the union. They'll get it done. Speaking of, lunchtime. Got a bologna sandwich over here. We know we've got each other, and that's where the union comes in. You know, yeah, it's the folks out there. You look down the line, you say, hey, these are my guys, and we're going to get a job done together, not by myself. Go up front for the pack, it's O'Donnell, Valentin, Shera, Eraldi, and Lorenzi. Four or five started last year, but some question their size with Valentin and O'Donnell under 250. Well, it is crap, but uh, what we've got is athletes. It's that foxhole theory. You've got to have five guys that you want in that foxhole with you. And uh, I would have no problem if we if we went to war today. I'd love to have these five guys right there with me. And the wiliest vet is senior center Ryan O'Donnell. He goes 240, but so what? He won the team's award last year for knocking down the most people, hence the rope. And he's a preseason pick to be the all-conference center. Kind of get ribbed by the other players, you know. I got I got Big Daddy 300 coming after me, but uh, um, I look forward to it. I like cutting them and having them fall on top of me and laugh a little bit and having the scrap for you, everyone. I'm the biter. Uh, let's see. Uh, Coach House called me the wily old veteran, hooking people, you know, <laughs> things like that, tripping. I just do what it takes to get done. All right. We've established that they're the blue collar, scrappy bunch. But do they resent guys like Brian Reeves who get all the glory and dance and whoop it up in the end zone? Fun watching them. It's fun seeing Brian throw his helmet off and jump in the stands. And we're too tired to run over there and throw our helmets off and dance around. So we'll just let him get after that. But every now and again, these guys cut loose too. You come off, you know, come off the uh, off of a good play, and you got a good block or something. You come in, you're jacked up, and you know, guys get excited, and that's what you need. I mean, that's definitely what you need, and it helps. So sometimes I like to do that too. You know, I get, mm -hmm. I get mouthy. <laughs> Coming up, the leader of the offense, the Magic Man, Chris Vargas, and we'll meet the quarterback of the defense, Pack Attack '93, going prime time. Stay with us. Welcome back, and I'm sure we're looking forward to more Mackey Stadium magic. Chris Vargas is back, and Rick Renner's in Mackey Stadium right now trying to drum up his own magic act. Hocus Pocus, you're out of focus. You're the star of our show. Ho, ho, hey, smile. You're the magic man. The magic man's four most memorable tricks. Circus Vargas open for bid here. November 2nd, 1991, down 42 to 14, late second frame, number one ranking Big Sky Championship, 20 game home winning streak, all on the line. And the Magic Man comes off the bench for 41 unanswered points for the greatest comeback in NCAA history. 346 yards via Air Vargas and two touchdowns. Page two, he 
is Drew. A week later, Varg gets the start at Montana, trailing 28 to 14 fourth quarter. Circus Vargas pulls a whopping 445 yards, two touchdowns out of his hat for a school record shattering performance that took two overtime. Another time to remember back in November, down 28 to 7 at intermission. Fans off to bingo, but Circus Vargas hit Keno. 388 yards pass and five touchdowns, all in the second half alone. We're probably like in about the 35 yard line, 30 yard line, and uh, had a little slot formation out to the left. And, uh, you know, they're playing a, a two deep coverage. And we get out there, and I just want to complete the ball, just keep the momentum going. And uh, I drop back, and no one's open. And all of a sudden, I see Reeves, he's running a little corner out to the end zone. And time's running out for me to hold on to the ball, so I just let it go. And as soon as I threw it, I'm like, oh, no, no, it's going to get picked. All of a sudden, the guy jumps and oh, right over Reeves, and they all fall down. And I'm going, oh, no, you know. And all of a sudden, the, um, the referee puts up his hands, boom, touchdown. I'm sitting there going, what? Touchdown? It's really weird because... Uh, we always talk about it, you know, well, we can come back, we can always do it, but too many times, you know, I threw an interception late in the game, I was like, man, maybe it's not going to happen this time, and, you know, we just, they kept giving us opportunities, and we just kept taking them as, uh, as the game went on, and, you know, it, it was really weird. I, I don't, I think everybody keeps on thinking that we will come back, and every game we'll do it, and so, as soon as it doesn't happen, that's when I go, we better start jumping out ahead right away. Be the Las Vegas Bowl. Down 28 to 3 at half, the magic comes roaring back against almighty Bowling Green of the Big Mac. 31 unanswered points. No muster, please. Only to lose on a special team blunder. But it didn't steal the MVP thunder. I never call him the magic man. Um, I don't want to get his head too big, but he's a little short, sawed off guy, and uh, he's special. So, you know, I always say it's not the size of the one, it's the magic in it. He started at seven, about seven years old. Wow. Yeah, this, uh, I started real young. My, I want to be just like my older brother. You know, he was Mr. Football, and he was everything to me. And, uh, you know, I'd follow his footsteps. I'd put on the Joe Namath outfit and run around the backyard and did all that stuff. So <laughs> I started young. I was running back linebacker. I was a big guy then. I was a big guy. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd eat my weed or something. I don't know. I think I've really grown, not, not just on the football field, but as a person off the field. Uh, a lot of the pressure between me and Fred, you know, uh, nothing between me and him, but, the, uh, you know, what you guys created, like the, the media and everything, said, oh, it's controversy, it's this. And, you know, it took a little bit of toll on us. And, you know, you sit there and you go out to practice, oh, man, and he completed five in a row. i got to complete six in a row. And things like that. And, you know, my coach said, hey, step back. You know, why don't you guys just compete against yourself? You know, if, if, you, if you do four for five, try to make it five for five next time, just against yourself. And that'll take the pressure off of, uh, of competing against each other. I think that really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I can take on to uh, later on in life. You know, we always rise to the occasion. And I think we're just going to go out there and it's going to be nice and easy to relax. We don't have to have the pressure of being number one. But we have that mindset we are going to be number one. And at the end of the year, we usually are. I would put Vargas up against any quarterback in the nation any day. You know, as far as uh, leading the team, you know, he doesn't have the mobility that Charlie Ward has, Marvin Gray. His arm is, is just as good. He can uh, read. I, I think he reads defenses better than any of those quarterbacks. He's probably the best quarterback that I've had in my life as far as reading defenses and getting the ball to you when it's supposed to be there. He, he is the best. Well, the quarterback of the defense, surprisingly, was a quarterback himself way back when. Steve Bryant was a scrawny 190-pound QB for Reed High School. Now he's a snarling 6-foot, 4-inch, 240-pound linebacker that could end up in the NFL. Let's take a look at the pride of Reed. Oh, look at Stevie Bryant. There's his senior pitcher back in 1989. Nice tuck, Steve. And there's Steve as the skinny quarterback. Ooh, how times have changed. Hey! It's more of a frenzy. Uh, maybe you get beat last play or something like that, and all of a sudden uh, you lose all focus and you just want to go up and hit somebody. You don't care who it is, center, quarterback, receiver, maybe one of your own guys. I get like that sometimes. I lose all focus of, you know, what play is on and stuff like that when you go in your rages. you got to be a little off the deep end playing there, too. Are you a little off the deep end? They say I am, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think Steve's opponents find it funny when they have to line up across the all-Big West Conference linebacker. 
He led the pack last year in sacks with 10 and tackles for losses with 17. Not to mention he was second on the team in tackles with 93. And this man can start a defensive fever. I mean, he's one of the most intense guys. He loves to play and he loves to hit. That's what he'll sit around and talk about all the time. And he's a leader on and off the field. I mean, I look up to him. I, I've never seen, seen a play where he, he hasn't. He hasn't given it everything he's got. Every play means something to him, and he wants to be the best on every snap. The play you take off may be the play that beats you, so run until you puke, you know? Yeah, Steve's not a big subscriber to the self-preservation theory on the field. He's taken a page out of his hero's book. Mr. Bryant likens his game to that of Hall of Fame linebacker Jack Lambert. Lambert was the man. I try to model my game after his, just run around and hit people. Yeah, he's a, he was a great player. He didn't uh, he didn't back down from anything. You just kind of have a little arrogance about you, you know. You figure, here I am, 240. I got to go up, beat up a 300-pounder, and then tackle maybe a 210-pound running back for no gain. Steve has met the challenges at the University of Nevada head-on. And he looks back and credits his primary role models, mom and dad, for giving him the confidence he needs. My mom stressed the education side of it. My dad was more, you know, get out there and get the football done. But it's never, they never put any pressure on me to keep doing it. It's just something you find in, inside yourself, and you like to do it, and that's why you keep doing it. And football's something Steve loves to do. He's 6'4", 240, and runs a 4'6", He's almost as fast as Brian Reeves. There's no question, NFL scouts are drooling. But first things first. Yeah, it's a dream. Dream about it since I ever started playing football, but uh, you don't think about it. Think about it, your head gets about this big and you throw away your senior season. If things happen, it happens. If not, I'll get in the rat race with everybody else. And after Steve's football career, he may want to follow in his father Hank's footsteps and become a police officer. And I don't think it'd be too wise to mess around on Steve's beat. Coming up, we'll take a look at the rest of that Bryant-led defense. We're just revving it up. Pack Attack 93 going prime time. Sunday. Could I have a BLT? <laughs> Go behind the scenes at the new Late Show with David Letterman. We're just trying to do an hour of silly television. Hear from the host himself in an exclusive interview. See how they turn the Ed Sullivan Theater into Dave's new home. Uh, so Topo Gijo, the old, the old mouse that's uh, in a stairwell eating old grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> a conversation with David Letterman. The years have not been kind to Topo Gijo. <laughs> When you think DuPont Stain Master, think Washburn Carpets. Why? Because Washburn offers you the largest in-stock selection of Stain Master in the West. Available in the broadest range of colors and styles. Only Washburn gives you free upgraded pad with every Stain Master. Plus, free carpet removal and free furniture removing. So go ahead and compare prices. You'll find ours are the lowest. And right now, get a 10% discount for cash. So when you think Stain Master, think Washburn, where you'll always find first quality carpets for less. American Gun Exchange, for the gun collector, law enforcement, and sports shooting enthusiast. For quality handguns, we carry only collectors and professional models. For hunting season, we have a new rifle and shotgun department. You'll find the gun you want. For ammunition, our prices are the lowest in town. For shooting accessories, we carry the holsters, cleaning kits, knives, everything you need. American Gun Exchange, dedicated to law enforcement and law-abiding citizens. 888 South Virginia, Reno. Oldsmobile, Volvo, BMW, tough names to follow. That's why Bill Pierce is the used car leader. We insist on cars with value, we demand trucks that are dependable, and we lead with prices that are affordable. For more than 20 years, we've treated used cars with the same commitment to quality as our new ones. Because when you buy a used car or truck from Bill Pierce old BMW Volvo, you've got more than our word on it. You've got our name on it. Welcome back, and the big question on defense, the secondary. They don't return one starter. Man, that's four of them gone, two of them to the NFL, but can these young guys push their way to greatness? Uh, nobody knows them right now. I mean, we're just people in uniforms right now. It's our job to go out and make a name for ourselves, and they have all the opportunity and ability to get it done. Now's their time. They've got the opportunity. When they show what they can do, then their names are going to come up. Done, like yesterday's lunch, one of the greatest secondaries of Nevada football history. 
Corey Duckett, fifth round selection, Cincinnati Bengals. Brock Marion, a lock Marion to make the Super Bowl champions. Xavier Carey, William Lackey, big shoes to fill. Big players left, and now we have to step up and try to fill their shoes. I think it's a good opportunity for me to come into this program and show what I can do. We feel like uh, we got something to prove, you know. I mean, uh, we, don't, we don't expect to come out here and just earn respect. You know, we haven't played one... We haven't started one game of college football yet, so we want to go out here and just, you know, surprise the nation when we suit up against Wisconsin. Big Ten, you know, I really don't care. I don't care if it was 1,010, you know. It's a Big Ten school, so what, you know, we're in Nevada, Reno, you know, we're going to come up there to ball. You know, I'm looking forward for that challenge. You know, they're going to look at us as freshmen coming in. They're going to try to throw the ball, but I'm going to be right there covering a the guy for the interception, hopefully. One guy all too familiar with pressure, Clayton Lopez, who spelled Xavier Carey in the Viva Las Vegas Bowl. Yeah, this is a different role for me. I'm a guy, you know, with a little bit of experience, not much, but uh, I try to, in practice in, in the games when they come, I try to use my experience to guide the, you know, the younger guys. But what's up with the dude? As a uh, reminder of our youth, we're going to cut off all our hair and start all over. So that's what we did. We started all over. We cut all our hair off. <laughs> Changing faces in the defensive secondary, no question, but not the case up front. No, a lot of experience with the linebackers and D-line. They're trying to keep the offense on both sides of the goal. At times last year, the D-line and linebackers just flat out got muscled. Tulane, they rushed for 265 yards. UNLV, they power up for 213. San Jose State, a whopping 225 yards on the ground. And Utah State rolls for 256. And the backers know it's time to buck up against the ground attack. Runs first, every you know, to every defense. Defenses, you know, you want a, you want a goose egg and you want zero yardage against the run. I mean, especially the front seven. That's where we take all our pride in. It will be Andy Boo and Steve Bryant's job to stop the run from the inside linebacker spot. And Mr. Bryant, the leader on D, is sick of hearing about the O. So far this year, all the talk's been about the offense and how they're going to put all these points on the board. Hell, we're going to bring in some close games. We don't want to be giving up 40 points and rely on the offense to score 50 points. So we're taking it as a defense. We're taking it on our shoulders, not, you know, not to give up the big scores. And, and the guys applying pressure from the outside are former Hug High star Marty Washington. He started every game last year. And look out for Thunder Dan Leadiff. The senior was slowed last season by injury. He says, this year is mine. I'm not going to wait around for anybody to make a play. I'm going to, you know, do what I can to, you know, make my own. Sure, to the point. Maybe silent pride could be the theme of these linebackers. You don't have a lot of vocal guys. I mean, our four starting inside line, or linebackers, you might not get a paragraph of words out of. But uh, they'll play hard and they're serious. They lock their jaws. There's no... Uh, messing around and they get out there and when they go to work they practice hard the pack will miss their leading tackler from last year lamont porter he is academically ineligible so that means guys like tawan hall are going to have to step up along with the wild thing todd norman todd norman is, is something that you look at and if you see him come out on the practice field with game day and he he looks like he's got a little frothing at the mouth that typical inside line but factor that you're looking at that's what we drive on as linebackers that's what our defense here at nevada thrives on hitting that's how we win rick renner has more with the rest of the front seven the defensive line every year you have to find something kind of motivation to keep you going through it and uh you know like the big hit or just the big play something like that that's what motivates me the d-line's got it all experience youth and plenty of food if you get hungry in between plays. I mean, you practice for a couple weeks against the same guys. You hit, hit, hit. Finally get to the game, and you're going to have one of the biggest games, Dave. I said, I know you can, because you, you go out here and you destroy our guys. And I said, you're, you know, you're a big bear, man. You got the hands the size of a damn pizza. There ain't nobody that can stop me. I feel like, you know, I'm the strongest one. It's either me or you going to fall, one of the two. If he's stronger, I'll give him, you know, his credit, but then I'm going to go around the next time. The scouting report says a run, 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 a do run, run. All you have to do is look at UNLV, Tulane, and New Orleans, and the Viva Las Vegas Bowl to see that. Oh, uh, yeah, you can't let a team come out and run the ball anything like that. You got to you gotta step up and shut it down. I mean, it's nothing nothing new. We practice it every day. You know, they can't come out and do that. So it's not hard to get our guys fired up to rush the passer. Run defense, number one, is not a pretty thing. I mean, it's nothing but us getting in there and getting, our, you know, our hands and our our face in, in, into the other guy and be, you know, the strongest, separate, and, and tackle. 
and we have worked real hard in the off season, all spring long, lifting in, in the weight room, you know, uh, talking about technique, and our guys have come back a lot stronger. They got here this this fall in tremendous physical shape. Diamond in the rough, Justin Kenkenny. Sure, that makes a dime, but he's going to get the play in time. The Hug High Star already on second team as a freshman. A lot harder than high school, that's for sure. <laughs> what, what kind of things have been going through your mind since you've been out this year? I just want to get in good shape and do the best I can. Next on Pack Attack 93, we'll go up close with the grunt up front, JJ. And we'll dance with wolves. Pack Attack 93 continues. <laughs> This loss right here in the weight room. If that's the case, Jimmy Jones could be the most valuable player. Hey, Mike, you're not kidding. You know, Jimmy Jones is the strongest guy on the team. He can bench 425, but that's nothing. Check this out. Give me a spot, G-Man. We'll see if Jimmy Jones can lift this defense to new heights. Big number 95 may be able to push up the iron, but he's not built like Schwarzenegger. He's not good-looking like Robert Redford. Not going to win any beauty contests. Jim Jones is just the grunt up front on D. Jones comes in and he's going to wait for it and he looks like he's about to die after every snap and he gets back in the hole and then he goes off again and then he's, you know. And so that ain't a pretty position. You can't be a pretty guy in there. We're the kind of guys who walk around campus and the girls are afraid of us and, you know, we're scary looking and all that. But, you know, we're, we're told, we're, you know, we're just like normal people off the field. But. Yeah, normal people with normal nicknames? Me and Jim, we have, it seems like we have a different nickname each week. One week we'll be the Freebirds, or we'll be the Hollywood Blondes. That's watching too much TV, <laughs> too much wrestling. Yeah, wrestling is a pretty good description of what pack star defensive tackle Jim Jones does, and man, he loves it. It's fun, I mean, especially when you get into talking wars out in the field, like after the play, and you're punching each other, and you're, you know, you're talking the talk, you know, and, yeah, and, it, and and at that point in the game, it, the pride factor even more of a, you know, that next play, you want, next play, you just want to rip each other's heads off, you know, but that's what football is about. That's the fun part. And he loves to play. He, he ignites our defense by the way he plays, and he is a leader on uh, our front. Jim Jones is the prototype, no-nonsense lineman, but he does have a soft side. Jim's father died when he was six. Since then, his best teammate in fighting life's wars has been mom. Her to watch me is you know, maybe having her watch him, you know, and we look almost exactly like me and my father did. So she's my biggest fan and she's my best friend and she used to bring a horn to high school games and she'd blow up foghorn, you know, and one of the boat ones and they used to throw her out, but she'd stay and yell and you could still hear her. And... Jim still listens for his mom at games, but he's also hearing something else now, the ticking of the clock that could end his football career. Now he may get a shot in Canada or the NFL, and if that doesn't work out, he may create a league of his own. I love the sport. It's it's something I couldn't live without. I mean, I'll, p I'll be playing it on the field when I'm 50 years old with the guys in you know in blue jeans. Hopefully, so, you know, because I'll miss it so much. But yeah, I'll miss it a lot. It's my life. Jim Jones plays with a lot of emotion, but he's about the last guy you're going to see doing one of these Brian Reeves-like dances. The fans love him, and Rick Renner takes us through a dance with wolves. Care to dance? You lead. Back to back to back. Yeah, I go like this. <laughs> Ball game, baby. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. He can't touch Viva Las Vegas, baby. Shoot him up. 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 <laughs> I gotta go home and practice my little dance. He'll <laughs> be ready for Saturday. <laughs> Probably called Pack Attack. That's what it's, yeah, there it is. It's gonna be called Pack Attack. <laughs> Don't touch that dial. More Pack Attack 93 coming at you. We're going prime time. Welcome back. You know, last year there was a lot of heat, to say the least, on the kicking game. In fact, this guy, Uwe von Galanos, even thought he could kick.
<laughs> yeah, you're right. We, you know, we looked a long time and hard to find a guy because you know and I know you win it with, you know, with the kicking game. Jim House is in the house with a new mouse. True Frosh, Philip Stamper from Oklahoma. They call him the OK Kid. That's for Oklahoma and a foot to match. Listen, Dayos is real good. And Kevin McKelvey came out of here and he had a pretty good shot, but um, I'm just hoping I can go in and do my job over the next four years and be there myself. And that's not the only kick in the grass. How about junior college product, punter Armando Avina? Great kicking name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a great athlete. You know, when he was a senior in high school, he played in uh, the Stockton area in a North-South Shrine game in the Coliseum, kicked two 50-yard field goals and was named the player of the game. So this guy is, is a talented guy. A big opportunity. You know, I, I didn't watch the bowl game, but I heard about it, and I heard about it a lot. And uh, I just feel like he'd come in and do the job. This tantalizing two are front runners for Wisconsin opening day. But the biggest bonus of this deal, double A holds for kid OK. I'm just trying to help him out because I know how it was for me my freshman year. We've been doing a lot. Their legs are kind of weary right now because we have kicked them a lot trying to find out what they're going to do in front of 76,000, you know. And that brings us to this. The pack preparing for their opener with Wisconsin. Rick, a chance to shock the nation. You know, the big bad Badgers are predicted as high as third in some polls in the Big Ten Conference. But you got to love the four-pack at home with the two rivals on the end, Boise State and UNLV. UNLV and then two other teams that are going to be tough at home. San Jose State and Northern Illinois, either of those teams could win the conference. And speaking of tough teams in the conference, the pack goes to Utah State. You know, that's the game of the year, October 16th. Some say this is going to decide the conference. We're going to have it all. All the highlights, the lowlights, right here on Pack Attack 93. Every Sunday at 4 o'clock following NFL football. I'm Mike Alanos. I'm Rick Renner. Be there.